morning church. Uh, today's teaching text is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 5 to 15, and I'll be reading from the NIV translation. It reads as follows. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be, re it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. A reward. If, if it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Kone. Good morning, church. How are you all doing this morning? Wonderful, wonderful. It's always an honor um, having the opportunity to be able to share God's word um, with his people. My name is Mo, as has been said, and I have the privilege of um, sharing God's word with you this morning. We're currently going through a series called I Am Who I Am. At the top there, as you can see, uh, we, we're basically looking at who God is. So this, this, this concept of I am who I am started when Moses said, who shall I say has sent me? And before going to Pharaoh, God says, tell them I am has sent you. I am who I am. I am that I am. And so we started looking at different aspects of who God was, um, how he displays himself to us as his people. We looked at God the Father. We looked at um, Jesus Christ the Son. And then we've spent the past couple of Sundays looking at the Spirit of God. Uh, last week we looked at, uh, Shiamu did a great, jo great job looking at um, the Spirit of God as a, as a voice of love. This week we're looking at the Spirit and the temple. And the title of our message this morning is, You Are God's Temple. You Are God's temple. And we'll be looking at what this then means for us as the people of God, what this then means for us in 2022, and, and, and how we can then live out our lives in light of that truth. I was asked um, just before preaching if I'm going to be talking about eating clean and eating healthy. I guess that's part of it, but I won't mention that at all. So for those of you who are like myself and want to keep eating unhealthy, for now you are fine. <laughs> so the three points we'll be looking at this morning as we expound on this concept of you are God's temple. Firstly is the Holy Spirit lives in you. Secondly, remember that God is holy. And thirdly, live out your lives as a temple. Let's get straight into it. Let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that it is in your word that we experience you. We not only hear about you and learn about you, but we experience you in and through your word. Speak to us this morning, we ask, Lord. Open up our hearts, open up our minds, and allow us to receive from you. We're not listening to me, we're listening to you through me, through your word, Lord Jesus. So speak through me this morning, Father. May what comes out of my mouth be consistent with the truth of your word. And may your people be encouraged, be convicted, and be blessed by the reading and the teaching of your word. As we speak about this concept that is being your temple, Father, let us hear you clearly. Bless our time this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 
So our teaching text, so I'm going to walk us through a couple of scriptures. And if you hear the screeching, I do move a lot. I apologize. I don't know then if I should move a little bit this way. Are these ones less squeaky? I don't know. We'll find out. I know it's less squeaky here, so I'll try and stay here. So our teaching text, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 16. Um, we're going to be looking at supporting texts that help us understand and see where God is speaking about the Spirit of God and where He speaks about the temple. But there are a couple of things I want us to look at as we look at um, the, 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 the title of We Are God's Temple. So in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 5 to 17, the teaching text, the context is there is division in the people of Corinth. So in chapter 3, Paul has to reprimand them and say, no, 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 guys, you are missing the main point. One of you is talking about the fact that you are aligned with Paul. Another one is aligned with Apollos. That is not why we're here. Both Paul and Apollos are on the same team, the team of God. And then he says, recognize that God is the one who allows growth for those of us who do the work. Right? So there are three analogies that are used in this, in this first um, uh, in this first text, in this first teaching text of ours. Uh, the first of which is God, uh, Paul uses an agricultural illustration, right? So he says, I plant, someone else waters, and God is the one who allows the growth. But again, he's taking the people to the direction of God. Then the second example that we see, so then he says, you are God's field. Then he goes on to say, you are God's building. And then he says, the foundation I'm the master builder and I, and I lay the foundation, but in fact, I don't, I don't actually lay any new foundation other than Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is Lord. So now the second analogy is that of a constru the construction context and a building, right? So you'll see then, he says, we then should be in a process where we build up. So there'll be other builders and the work that you use and the materials that you use to build on the foundation will then be judged at the end of the day through the fire, but ultimately, because you are in Christ as the foundation, you'll have your salvation, but the quality of your works will then be shown at the, at the day, at, at judgment day, as it says. Then the last example, so again, so focus on God, focus on Jesus as the foundation, and then in verse 16, it speaks about the fact that you are God's temple. We'll look at a verse in a couple of chapters later, then it goes on to say, uh, live lives that honor uh, uh, God, God being a temple in your body. So now, by the way, we're seeing the Trinity in that text, right? So that's, that's one, one of those beautiful texts where you see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, so when we see this teaching text, this is what it's speaking about, and we're looking at what this means within the context of being God's temple. So I'm going to come back to this teaching text, but I wanted to lay the foundation, no pun intended, around uh, what the text is actually teaching and then what we can learn from subsequent verses around being God's temple. So, okay, our first point, the Holy Spirit lives in you. So what you need to remember this morning is you are God's temple. The first part of that then, what that means is the Spirit of God lives in you. And we see this in the text, this, 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 the title is straight from, this, from the Scriptures, Right, so if you have a look at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? You are God's temple. That's what the Bible says. Then it goes on to say, and that God's Spirit lives in you. Also from the text. You're God's temple and the Spirit of God lives in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. I think we have it up there. It reads as follows. We're going to read verse 19 and verse 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. The price is the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You're the temple of God. Therefore, we have a responsibility to honor God with our bodies. What exactly does this mean? So in Romans chapter 8, verses 9, 9 to 17, we're also going to look at that on your screens. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. Another version says you are not controlled by the Spirit. You're not controlled by the flesh, but you're controlled by the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. 
the constant theme is that there's a different kind of life when the Spirit of God lives in you. We live a new life, a life that's in line with God and the principles and the values and the characters of God, characteristics of God. Then it continues, verse 12, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. You, however, okay, so we're going to continue, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The fact that the Bible says we are the temple of God, and then the Spirit of God lives in us, is that it means that we have access to being led by God, as opposed to the old life that was led by us in our desires. So the, the verses we look at today and what the Scriptures teach us is, when we talk about the Spirit of God on this earth in our bodies, there's always this tension between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit of God. It's one of the big things that we'll understand when we learn about the Spirit living in us. We have a different kind of empowerment and access to the empowerment that is through the Spirit of God. Let's keep going. Um, verse 15. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you will live in fear again. That's the old life. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I, I, I wrestled with whether I should include verses 16 and 17 or not, because up to that point, it had made the point. But I felt this is one of those biblical truths that are important to hear. The Bible says, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that you are God's children. Therefore, you are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Galatians chapter 2, amen, that's, that's a hallelujah, praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul says to the Galatian church, this life that I live, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When Jesus ascended, he said, I will leave you with another helper, the Spirit of God. So the Spirit is like a proxy for God like a representative on God's behalf in our bodies. This is the truth that the Spirit lives in us. And church, we forget this truth. I forget this truth. There's power that comes with the Spirit of God being in us, church. When Jesus ascended, he said, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will receive power. To be my witnesses, but you receive power. Church, hey, there's power inside. There's power inside. Um, Galatians 5, verse 17. So, so we'll look at this passage of Scripture later on in our message, but the verse that I want to emphasize highlights the gist of the spirit and the body. And so Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, he says, so I, live, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do what you want to do. In this message, church, we're not saying, there's not an expectation from God that you live a sinless, perfect life. There isn't an expectation that you will be without sin. So let's, let's remove that, 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 that misconception because I think we, we end up living in shame and in lies because we miss the truth. And the truth of it is just keep in tune with the Spirit of God. You'll mess up, you'll make mistakes, you'll miss the mark. But as you're led by the Spirit daily, that's where God wants you. That's where God wants you. Okay, so, so that's our first point. Um, the Holy Spirit lives in you. So we're looking at the fact that you're a temple. The first sort of key truth about that is the Spirit of God lives in you. So let's, let's go deeper then with this. Our second point is remember that God is holy, right? Remember that God is holy. 
What we're going to look at now, remember, the title is You Are the Temple of God. You Are God's Temple. Now, in order for us to fully appreciate the understanding of the concept of temple, we need to understand historically in the Old Testament what the people of God understood so that when we understand what Paul meant when he said, you are the temple of God, there's that reference point. So we're going to dive back. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures, um, looking at what exactly it means for us to be a temple of God. So in Exodus chapter 36 to 40, before the concept of temple, there was the concept of tabernacle. I'm going to get a little bit technical with you guys for the next few moments. Bear with me. Take notes as you need to. Before the concept of temple, there was the concept of tabernacle. That's where God communicated with Moses for the first time about his presence amongst the people of God. So Exodus 36 to 40, there's a high-level overview of what God instructs the people of God, right? Starts off um, Exodus, so Exodus 20, basically, they've come out of, they've been freed from Egypt, they're in the wilderness, they've been freed from Pharaoh, and now, from Exodus chapter 25 to 31, and then again 36 to 40, God is speaking to them about what the tabernacle will look like. Tabernacle being the presence of where God was to be. So Exodus 36, God speaks to, to Moses about the tabernacle. Exodus 37, he now gets into the details. The Ark of the Covenant, the table, the lampstand, the altar of incense. Exodus 38, the altar of burnt offering, the, out, the, the courtyard, the outer courtyard. Exodus 39, the priestly garments and how the priests are supposed to conduct themselves in the tabernacle. And then they speak about the glory of God coming down on the tent of meeting. Okay, so, so, te so, so temple. Now, as we understand temple, as I said, the first language that was used of a space for God where God's presence would be was tabernacle, as seen in Exodus um, 25, Exodus all the way through out there. Now, the definition of the word tabernacle then, remember, so God instructed them to build a tabernacle. The, the Hebrew word for the word tabernacle is mishkan. It means three things, dwelling, sanctuary, tabernacle, right? Basically, they understood it to mean the dwelling place of God. So when they said tabernacle in the Old Testament, it simply meant a dwelling place of God, right? The, the, the word sanctuary was used there as well, where it meant a holy or sacred place or a consecrated space. But in its purest sense, in its purest form, tabernacle meant a dwelling place of God. So in Exodus 25 verses 8 to 9, this is what God says to, to Moses, as we then understand the concept of tabernacle and its significance. So in Exodus 25, I don't think I have it up there, but I'll read it for us. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern that I will show you. So the pattern was Exodus 36 to 40, Right? So we're seeing language in the Bible where God says, create a space where I will dwell among them. Remember, up to this point, God didn't dwell amongst the people. Remember, only Moses had contact with God every once in a while, very seldom, right? Now he's saying, we're going to create a space where you know I will be, where you know I'll find you, you'll find me. Okay, so then... God's presence. So we've, we've, we've got tabernacle, we've got God's presence. In Exodus 19, 20, we remember that. So before God would reveal himself in the tabernacle, this is what happened. So in Exodus 19, 20, it says, the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses up to the top of the mountain. So up to this point, so God was in heaven. Cool. Then there was Genesis 1, 2, and 3, where God was in the Garden of Eden. He was with the people. But then practically, he would come down and descend on the mountaintop and he would call and invite Moses, only Moses, by the way, only Moses got to experience the presence of God, only Moses to come up to the mountaintop, and then he would receive instructions and communication from God. That's the context, right? So, so our end point is, the Bible says God lives in me, but do you realize how far we've come? That there was a point where literally only one human being in existence could see God, and even then barely, so this is where we are. So this is the, the full appreciation of tabernacle. So, 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 so we see an increase in proximity of God where he was there. Then he was sort of there. Then he's like, okay, Marie's around here. You know, we're seeing him, sort of, you know. And then the Bible says he's here. Like you look in the mirror, you look down at your feet, and it's like, oh, my word, he's here. Profound, 
stuff, church. Profound stuff. Praise be to God. First Kings, amen, amen. Um, okay, so let me show you a picture of the tabernacle real quick. Just to contextualize it. It's a bit underwhelming, ne? <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure I go, like, the first time I saw this picture, I was like, ha, huh, okay. I thought it would have been something more, like, more. Sharp. So that's the tabernacle. Tent of meeting. So God would instruct Moses to build that, pack it up. They would move where they would move, set it up. You know what I'm saying? So, so this is the tabernacle. Take time to read Exodus 36, 40 to understand. Exodus, so those four chapters are breaking down what's happening here. Right? So the tabernacle comes into existence. I think we have another picture that shows, yeah, so basically now it shows you inside. So that top left part is called the holy place. So the, the outer space is called the courtyard. If you want me to send you this picture, I can send it to you because it's on my phone. But the courtyard is on the outside. And then that building on the top left corner there, it's the holy place. There's a reason I'm showing you this picture. The holy place is where only the priests were allowed to be. Right? So, again, remember I said Exodus 39, they talked about priestly, priestly garments and how they were to conduct themselves. There's a little corner in the extreme top left corner that's called the Holy of Holies, where one person, the high priest, once a year would enter on the Day of Atonement on behalf of the entire people of Israel. So the tabernacle... <laughs> We're privileged because we have access to God whenever we want. But back in the day, even the mighty high priest, which was the highest religious office for the people of God, only went into the presence of God once a year. <laughs> once a year. Access to God was a mission, was a task. And if you ask yourself the question, why? Well, the answer is sin. That's why. Plain and simple. Okay. 1 Kings 6 verse 1. Um, let me see the next picture. So then, remember I said, the concept we're talking about is temple. But before temple was tabernacle. So God instructed Moses about tabernacle, this space, this dwelling place of God that you, would, you could set up, you could pack away, you could set up. Then, the concept of temple came about during the days of David and Solomon, and then moving forward. So 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, so before that, David had had, so David was a man after God's own heart. He had this vision to create this, this beautiful space for God, a house of God, to honor God, right? Because up to this point, it was just this flimsy thing. And like David had a lot of money. They were wealthy. Like, I want to erect this building for God. God says, that's cool, that's okay. You're not going to build it, though. I see the vision, but your son's going to build it. So at 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, Solomon is taking over the mandate of building the, 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 the temple of God. This is what 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 says. This is Solomon speaking. This is the Bible telling us about the time frame that is expanded. So 1 Kings 6, verse 1. In the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, 480th year, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. In other versions, it says he began to build the house of the Lord. The reason that's significant is because the definition of the word temple that's being used here is a word that means simply house. It simply means house. A place of dwelling for the Lord. Right? Right? So, so where we had tabernacle, which was a dwelling place of the Lord, now we move to a dwelling building of the Lord. So that's pretty much the only difference between tabernacle and temple. They built a fixed building. So when you talk about temple, it's a fixed space, not one that you pack up and, and set up and move and, and, and keep going. In 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 51, this is, this is what um, Solomon says now when we go further in this notion of the presence of God. When all the work... King Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished. He brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasures of the Lord's temple, some say the Lord's house. Chapter 8, verse 1. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at, at, 
at Jerusalem, the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes of the chiefs of the Israelite families to bring up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. We've got a picture for, of, of the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. Just to then specifically hear what the Bible says about where exactly the, the presence of God was. So remember I showed you a picture that showed the outer courts. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, images. There are many images that you'll see, but these are the, the, the ones that they say are some of the most accurate images of the, 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 the Temple of Solomon. Known as Solomon's Temple, but it's the Temple of God. Now remember I told you in the previous image, there was that corner at the top left, the Holy of Holies. The same thing existed here. The significance of the Holy of Holies is this. In, in, in 1 Kings 8 verse 1, it says they brought up the Ark of the Covenant, right? So again, we're going to get a little bit more technical. So the Ark of the Covenant is where the Bible describes specifically where the presence of God was. So have a look with me here in Exodus chapter 25, verses 21 to 22. So Exodus 25, this is where God again is giving instructions. And so he goes on to say... Place the cover on top of the ark and put it in the ark of the testimony, which is also called the ark of the covenant, which I will give you. Verse 22, there above the cover between the two cherubim that are above, that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you. So let's show the ark of the covenant. So, so these are pictures that are said to represent the ark of the covenant, right? The significance of the ark of the covenant and the reason why Hollywood and Indiana Jones went around chasing after the ark of the covenant <laughs> is because... You see, come this side. So you see those two figures on the top there. Those are called cherubim, right? So the Bible says the cherubim are over what they call the mercy seat. It's not a seat, but it's literally underneath those wings, right? And that's specifically where the sacrifices of atonement were put. So, so literally by the mercy seat. Right? Where in, in Exodus 25, verses 21 to 22, God says, it's there underneath the wings of the cherubim where I will meet with you. So there's method to God's madness, dare I blaspheme. Right? God knows what he's doing. So the reason there was the outer courts and there was the holy place and then there was the holy of holies is because he's a holy God. So by the way, the technical aspect of the story that I was mentioning, in Genesis chapter 3, as I, again, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, man was living, humanity was living in the presence of God. They were walking around freely in the presence of God until they introduced sin into the garden and they were kicked out. In Genesis 3 verse 24, when they were kicked out, the Bible says, God placed two cherubim with a sword with flames. Do you see the cherubim? So where God was protecting access to himself, separation through sin prevented people from coming in. The Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim, are protecting access to the presence of God. Why cherubim? We don't know. But we can see and draw connections from the Bible in Genesis 3. And the reason Genesis 3 is significant, folks, is when we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant and we're talking about the Temple of God, we're talking about the presence of God. Genesis 3, humanity was in the presence of God and sin kicked us out. Right? So as we look now, when we look at the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies, sin is what prevented the rest of Israel from being in access with God. Okay, I think we've gotten through the technical stuff. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, this concept would have been a shocker to the people of God. So the reason we ask the question, when is it the last time you heard something surprising? You heard something for the first time. So now you have a full appreciation of the tabernacle and the temple. It was a sacred space, correct? We can all agree. God went through lengths to ensure that access to that space was limited. Now, can you imagine when this Paul character speaks to the church in Corinth and says, by the way, things have changed, and the temple is you. Me? How? Me? And when I know the thoughts I had last night, you can't say the temple is me. Like, I know what I wrestle with literally coming to church. <laughs> You're telling me the temple is me. They couldn't comprehend it. 
The reason we walked you through that whole process was to understand the context in which Paul said you are the temple of God. So, so, so quickly, see how my time is doing. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, so let me, let's show this picture real quick. So there was a time back in the day, right, when taking a picture required a sacred space. Yeah? See this dark room, 2022, Google allows us to see. But I remember as a kid, I wished I knew what the dark room looked like, right? So you had this thing called film. So I'm not that old, but I was old enough at the time where I remember operating one of these cameras. So this thing called film, you, put it, you, you open the flap of the camera, you put in the film, you roll it, you click it, you close, you take pictures. You don't know how the pictures turned out. You take and you pray. Take, pray, take, pray. <laughs> so you take and you pray. And then, then you must go to a sacred space. You take your camera, you stand in the queue, you pay someone. He takes the film and goes somewhere that no one else has access to. They do the things they do. You come back days later, you have these beautiful pictures. Now you see them. The day people found out there was this thing called a Polaroid camera that was coming. And you could take a picture, and all you do is shake for a few seconds, boom, you can see the picture. And the camera is yours. You hold it, you walk around with it, you keep it with you. To comprehend was a bit of a challenge. Because, wait, we don't need to go to that sacred space anymore. What do you mean? That little corner, that dark room? Technology advances, and now... In our phones, I take a picture, I see it right now, I put it in my pocket. I don't need to have a big camera and keep it in my house. My phone is with me all the time. Spiritual analogy to what I shared there is where there was once a dark room that no one had access to. There is now access today. Literally, the Bible says you are the temple. So where I walk, I don't need a rabbi, I don't need a priest to go on my behalf in God's presence for me. God is here. Church, that's what we talk about when we say, you are God's temple. Sin is what separated us from God and from God's presence. There are scriptures consistently that speak about the fact that around God's presence, there's a certain way you conduct yourself. Exodus 3 verse 5, the Bible says, God was, Moses was approaching a burning bush. The bush started speaking. It said, Moses, take off your sandals, for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. In Exodus 19 and 20, when the people are supposed to come into contact with God, and he comes down in the scary storm, the people are required to cleanse themselves and prepare themselves accordingly. By the way, that's why when I preach, I wear suits. I still have this old school mentality. It's, it's, again, it's flawed, but there's this thing where I was trained where it's like, Ish, you know. But by the grace of God, notice, so this was the old school mentality. I needed to dress up to preach the word of God. But we are the temple of God. So we can show up as we are. As long as we keep Jesus as the center, Jesus as the focus, Jesus as the foundation. And we're led by the Spirit. You are God's temple. By the grace of God, God's spirit lives in you. Let's go to our third and final point, and with this we will close. May God give us the grace to live in accordance with the recognition that we are the temple of God. So this message is not a message to convict us and have us feel shame because we know how often we fall short. That's not what this message is about. This message, one, is to help us understand here and understand the truth of God and internalize that truth and walk out of here conducting ourselves in a manner that's consistent with the truth we just heard. It's often what we do when we preach on a Sunday. We don't expect to change the world every single Sunday, right? Ours is to present the word of God and through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit have that truth transform us. And so in this text, it says to us, if we're the temple of God, the Spirit lives and empowers. That's the takeaway, church. 
because the Spirit lives in you, you have access. By the way, you're not supposed to be some superhero Christian who tries to do everything that's spoken about in the Bible in their own might. That's, that's incorrect theology. No one can do that. Because outside of God and outside of Jesus, it's just me and my flesh. And I am flawed. I can tell you that. My wife will be the first to attest to that. I'm a great guy, by the way. I'm just... <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> but by the grace of God, it's only through the supernatural spirit of God that I can daily overcome whatever I'm going through. Whatever I'm going through. Because there is nothing that is too difficult for the power of God. And church, that's what I actually want to feel led to encourage us of this morning. We are going through a lot as society and as a people of God. Like we're going through stuff that we're not sharing with other people. God wants to remind you that he loves you with everything that he is and that he's not only sending people, but he's sending his spirit to remind you that there is hope. I can be struggling with a sin for weeks, for months, but where the spirit of God is, there's freedom and there is hope. I can be going through difficulties at work in the family, but may I be reminded when I spend time with the Lord that, Reno preached this a couple of Sundays, the present sufferings are nothing in comparison to the glory experienced in Jesus. And that's not to say life is going to be perfect. It actually isn't. Life is often more difficult than it is perfect. It's not the notebook. One of my favorite movies, one of my favorite movies. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more messy than The Notebook. It's a little bit more difficult, and that's okay. Why is it okay? Because I'm the temple of God. What does that mean? Man, the Spirit of God is here. When I sleep and I have an argument with my wife, yo, the Spirit of God is here. When those finances just don't seem to be adding up. Hey, but the Spirit of God is in this hand that is writing that reconciliation. May God remind us that as a little baby knocks on the other door, the Spirit of God is still inside. And that means there's hope. Let me pray for us this morning, church. Yes, Lord. Um, Lord, we're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 that you command us to honor you in, in how we live our lives, to honor you with our bodies. May we be reminded of the hope that comes with your spirit, Lord. It's okay that your people are going through a lot, Father. It's okay that we're going through a lot, Lord Jesus. It's okay that sometimes it feels like we're in a season that is more difficult than we've ever experienced, Lord Jesus. But man, where there is Jesus, where there is the cross of Jesus, the Son of God sacrificed everything for me. Sent me his spirit so I may be reminded that daily I can tap into the spirit of God. I can access the spirit of God. I can be encouraged by the spirit of God. So encourage each one of us today, Lord, that the victory is already yours, Lord Jesus. It can take as long as it takes, but the bottom line is the victory is already yours, Lord Jesus. Help us hold on for those who need to hold on, Lord. Give us grace, Lord Jesus, if things look bleak and difficult. For your word reminds us that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in Morindin. Mm. Lives in each one of us. 
Encourage us this morning, Lord Jesus, I pray. Remind us we are God's temple. Remind us that your spirit lives in us. Remind us that you're a holy God. Empower us to live as the temple of God. (laughs) In the name of Jesus, we pray all these things. And all of God's people say, Thank you.